Billet intake manifolds. They are some of the coolest parts you'll find in the world of motorsports. But let's be real, they're also some of the hardest to make. For many machinists interested in performance engineering, me being one of them, creating a billet intake manifold feels like reaching the holy grail of manufacturing. I've looked around and noticed there are plenty of videos covering basic design tutorials. But there's not much out there that dives into every intricate step of making something like this from start to finish. In this series, we are going to change that. I'm going to take you through every step from design to manufacturing this exact intake manifold using Fusion 360, from the initial concept to finished product. Whether you are a seasoned machinist or just getting started with machining or with Fusion 360, this series will walk you through the entire process, showing the techniques and considerations that go into creating a complete design, not just a simplified example. So if you're ready to dig into the details of turning a block of metal into a functional, high-performance part, you're in the right place. Let's get started. So I have literally hundreds of hours into the design and programming of this part, and making these videos is gonna take even more time. So this is quite a bit of effort. So if you get any value from this content, please like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring the bell so that you don't miss any of the upcoming videos. Okay, so let's get into Fusion 360 here. Couple caveats to this. When I started this project, I was very new to Fusion 360 and I didn't quite understand the workflow yet. So there's a couple mistakes I made in the beginning, mainly with not uh, inserting things into components. And then if we look here, I was supplied with a couple of scans from the customer. So this first scan is a scan of the engine that we were working with, which is a Honda J32 V6. And he supplied me this scan of the engine, which is pretty rough. So it wasn't really good to pull data off of as far as like the flanges, but it was good for creating the planes and locating the, the sketches of the flanges as I drew them. The other big mistake I made is this was one of the first times I've ever worked with mesh data as well. So the biggest mistake I made was not aligning my planes that I, I created to the origin of this, this whole model here. If we look at this, here's the two construction planes I created. I did that by going up here into the mesh, uh, mesh editor here. Uh, I imported the mesh using the insert mesh function and then if you direct edit the mesh, it'll allow you to create planes based off of points on those faces. So I created these two planes. They did end up exactly 60 degrees from each other. And so I thought it was okay. I had kind of assumed that the, the person that sent this to me aligned this to a plane, but in reality, it was like 0 0.0093 minutes off or something. So just the slightest amount, which actually ended up making it a real pain in the butt down the line. Moral of the story is make sure your planes that you're creating on your mesh are aligned to the origin of the model. That's how I created those planes. There's plenty of videos on out there on how to do this. So I'm gonna hide those planes and I'm gonna show the lower runners, which was the first part that I modeled off of this, this scan data. I didn't just model it off the scan data. I also had some hard parts that the customer sent me to reverse engineer or blueprint, uh, as well as a gasket for each side to, to blueprint as well. So I could double check all my measurements the old fashioned way with calipers and things. That guaranteed that the, the flanges would be correct then I could use just the mesh to basically align them to each other since this is a V pattern engine those flanges have to be perfect to each other and align correctly for the bolts and everything to go in and the and the faces to sit flush on those flanges okay so I'm gonna roll back this timeline on this on this lower runner section so I'll activate that lower runner um, and I'm gonna roll back the timeline all the way to the beginning so I'm not gonna show you guys the actual sketches because I don't wanna give away all of the dimensions that I created and everything. But basically there's the first sketch and it was created on that plane that was on the, that I created off of the mesh data. So that's the first sketch. So here's the second sketch on that side. So we have the first side sketch and the second side sketch. And then I started extruding these. So there's my first flange. So you'll notice um, order of operations is pretty important when you're doing a part this complex. You'll notice I just extruded the outer flange and the holes, the mounting holes. And I just chose an arbi arbitrary number. This is a half inch thick, I believe, half inch extrusion. But I left these ports blank. I do have the sketch in there for the port, but I made it a construction line so that it wouldn't become part of the extrusion. And then we have the second one here. So basically that's the first real operation is to just create those two flanges and then make sure they're aligned to that sketch. Sorry, not the sketch, the, the mesh. 
so that your finished part will align with all the bolt holes and everything. So this is gonna be a little cumbersome at first here because of the way I did this, it wasn't really correct as far as, as far as the workflow goes in Fusion. I ended up actually making the components after the fact and kind of moving some of the sketches into that component and the bodies and stuff. So stuff got a little funny down here. Basically that's the starting point that you would want to start on. And this is now in its own component under lower runners is what I called it. So I did those first two sketches and extruded those flanges. And then uh, I created some sketches for, if you look real closely, these port sketches are slightly bigger. So they leave the wall thickness that I wanted between the, those and the port data. So basically it's like a hundred and, I think it was like 150 thousandths wall thickness. And then I started to create some sketches. So I have both of those sides. I kind of did it back and forth between those two sides as I went along. And then I created some planes out here in space where I wanted the, the runners to end up basically. So then if we move this forward here, um, I created a plane, see how it's crooked to the origin. I, it's not aligned at all that way. So it's, it's way off. So I should have aligned all this to origin originally, but I didn't. So this was creating a plane that was piercing through parts on my sketch so that I knew it was uh, dead flat to each side. So everything would be even. And again, if I had aligned this or to origin, this would look square against the part, not all crooked and wonky. And then I created a sketch where I wanted runners to end up. So this oval is basically the top side of the runner where I have it on that split flange there. And then these sketches back here were the, the outside of the runner at the at the head flange itself. And then from there, I did a loft feature. There's a there's a few ways you can guide these. You can use guide curves or you can use uh, normal to profile. There, there's a few ways to guide them. So depending on what shape you want, you can use different methods to guide these lofts. I chose to use, I believe a normal to curve. Here, we'll just open one of these and edit. Um, yeah, so I have direction, which is basically, it's normal to the profile. And then you can give it like a value here, a takeoff weight to, tell it how normal to the profile to be basically you can guide the you can guide the shape of that based on using the normal to the profile to get it to be smooth to the profile or you could like draw a center line down the center of it where you want it to be in this case it would have had to be a 3d contour like a 3d sketch for the center line which would be a little difficult to draw so I chose to just use the the end constraints as my my guides basically. So if we move forward here, I did all those different uh, loft features in order to create the outside of the runner. So now I've basically created these flanges off of the mesh and then the lofted outside diameter of the runners. These sketches like this oval sketch was just basically playing around with shape and size. I was doing some calculations to make sure that the area here was slightly larger than the area down at these these ovals so that the the runner would have a nice taper as it goes up so it slightly increase in volume as it meets this face. We can talk about the design constraints that go into intake manifolds in another video, but basically the idea is to create velocity and flow and slowly decreasing the area around that runner as it gets closer to the head, you will induce a velocity at the back of the valve, which will in turn help internally supercharge the engine, depending on how you design that and how well you do with the shapes of the curves and things like that. But basic rule of thumb is a slight taper, no more than three and a half degrees angle or seven degrees included angle to create velocity without creating turbulence. Probably a little less than that is probably better because that's right on the verge of turbulence if you go there. So anyway, so we'll move forward here. Okay, so now I started to sketch where I wanted the inside of the ports to be. I did that on both sides. So you can see my original sketch I used as a as a projected contour, and then I offset that contour in my 150 thou, which basically lined up exactly with my original sketch for the ports. So I have all the information I need there to create the internal loft cuts, but I need to create as many features as I can on the outside of this part before I loft cut those ins insides, or else I might run the risk of extruding a body back into the inside of that port. So order of operations is pretty important here. And you'll see that in this sketch, I created the flange where it's gonna meet the upper runners. And then I extruded that down. So now I have basically a closed body with two head flanges, all the lofted runners, and the, the mating flange for the upper runners. Uh, all as one solid body with no internal features. So then I went about adding some fillets under here. The fillets are, let me turn off this mesh. So the fillets are 
basically designed to be machinable. So at least the radius of your ball nose cutter that you're gonna be using uh, so that you're not driving it into sharp corners as much as possible. I have found that Fusion has some issues creating fillets and we'll talk about some of the tricks to get around some of the difficulties in that later on. But basically there's the basis of the part. Uh, and then let's see what I did here. Okay, I created a, a, a plane that is cutting through the part. Looks like aligned uh, perpendicular to the, the length of the part. Okay, so I'm creating fuel rails so that I can create a basic sketch of the fuel rails so that I can create the mounting points on here for the fuel rails. And I can play with the clearance of the fuel rails to the upper runners and things like that. Uh, I know I had to play with this quite a bit going back and forth because the customer ended up changing the style of injectors that he wanted to use. Uh, so we went back and forth on the design on that. So I began drawing these sketches for the fuel rails and I was, let's just roll forward here a little bit so you can kind of see. So basically I started with uh, figuring out the height that I needed the injector to sit at. Uh, and that was based off of these fuel rails and the distance from the injector to uh, the, the head flange there. And then I did a little cut here. So I, I made this and then I did an extrude cut to give me a surface to draw off of because that surface would be now at the right height of the injector. And then I created uh, a body. So I drew on this surface here. I drew on that surface there and created a body that went down to the runners. So, so this is a good example of where you would start running into an issue with this body possibly extruding into that bore. If you, if you had already cut out the port on this runner, you would have been extruding this a block down into that port. So since this is a square, these corners that are inside the part here would have extruded down to probably that height and been poking out into that runner. So that's why it's important to do all these outside features before you start extruding any, any of the internal features, or in, in this case, it'll be a loft cut. So you can see how I created those flats first, and then I went and drew on those flats and created the, the standoff where the injector is gonna be able to sit. And if we move forward, you can see that. And I gave those a draft angle as well so that it was it would be easier to fill it and machine later on. When you start getting into machining for super complex parts like this, uh, you really have to think way, way ahead on how every part of this is gonna be manufactured so that you don't end up walking yourself into a corner that can't be machined. So from there, looks like I started adding a bunch of fillets. So I filleted all these areas around here. So basically we're, we're getting to a point where this looks like it could be like a, a cast part or something, but the idea is to have these fillets in here so that you can use a ball nose end mill to finish all of these surfaces nicely with, without running them into a corner they can't reach or something like that. So that's basically the gist of it, why, why I'm doing it that way. It looks like now that I've got those injector pockets there, I decided to go ahead and loft cut the inside of these runners. So I basically used those sketches that I had made back here. So this sketch and those sketches uh, to use those profiles to loft cut. And I used pretty much the same end constraints on those on that loft cut as I did on the loft that created this runner originally. So that the inside will be the basically the same shape as the outside, just a smaller diameter. So if we open all those up, you see that I've created these nice smooth runners in a nice tapered orientation, and it leaves me with a really nice flange to mount those upper runners on. So hopefully you guys are keeping up with me there. This is obviously not a super detailed video. If I detailed every feature of this, this would take hours. Um, so I'm giving you guys kind of a general overview. If you guys have any more specific questions, please put them in the comments down below and I'll do my best to answer them in subsequent videos in this series. So now we have the basic lower runners here. So now we just have to add some features to make them like a finished part. So we're probably gonna add some uh, fuel rail mounts, some injector pockets, um, so a bolt hole flange up here, and then an O-ring groove. So let's see what I did first here. So it looks like I started out with creating the injector pocket. I just basically drew my injector circle for my O-ring diameter on these faces in this sketch here and then just extrude cutted those through. And then I did the same on the other side. So now we have our injector holes, pretty simple feature there. And then I added threaded holes in this flange that I had drawn earlier. So I had already drawn the, the center points of these, these holes when I drew this flange to make sure I had room for O-rings and things like that. So again, thinking forward on the design. 
Uh, let's see, what is this feature? Oh, okay, so I'm starting to draw the fuel rail mounts here. And then looks like I filleted those. So I filleted those fuel rail mounts. And those were easy to extrude just to this body since I, it was just intersecting this. That's why I didn't need to draw it before I, ex I cut these inner ports out. Because it was easy just to extrude to this surface instead of it possibly cutting in at a funny angle or something like that. So then I did the other side and filleted those. So if you're watching my timeline down here, you can see all the steps this took. So we're pretty far, we're basically a whole screen width into the timeline here. But those are gonna be the fuel rail mounts. And I had drawn that profile earlier so that I knew, I don't know where it was, but so that I knew where those mounts would need to be. There they are. So I actually changed this location later on and that's why this looks different. But because like I said, we were playing around with the fuel injector location. Basically, that's the basic part. And then we're adding some features here like more threaded holes for the fuel rails. Uh, so I did four threaded holes there. So this is where stuff starts to get a little funky because I was drawing stuff in the future and then referencing it back to this part. So my timeline on this actual runners is a little funky because I created subsequent parts that, that this original part was linked to. So it kind of jumps back and forth a little bit. So it gets a little bit confusing on the timeline here. So these fillets are actually on Oh, okay, that's that's the fillet there where I was trying to match the original port sketch by using a fillet command here and making this injector hole nice and filleted. Uh, so it more or less matched the Honda injector port that's cut out in the head. Okay, and then I started drawing stock on here. So this is a stock reference that I had drawn for the stock around this part. When we got into the machining side of things, I came back and drew this to represent the stock that this was going to be machined out of this would have been easy it would have been easy to have fusion just automatically create the stock except for that this part was not aligned to the origins so so the stock was coming out at a funny angle compared to the part so i i ended up going back and and drawing this stock as a selectable body that i could use to to represent the stock on the machining side Anyways, that is about it on this part. I did come back and create an O-ring groove in here, and I'm not sure exactly where it is because I was drawing subsequent parts after this. Let me see if I can find it here. Okay, so there's the beginning of it, and then I did some fillets around the inside corners. Uh, so Fusion has some problems with its sketches. I was not able to sketch this entire O-ring groove because Fusion would fail and be unable to compute when I tried to fillet these in the sketch. So I extruded that, that groove like this, and then I went in and filleted the outside corners and the inside corners. And that made Fusion much more happy. So anytime that you can simplify a sketch and use the parametric features, the, the solid modeling features after the fact, it seems like Fusion's a little more happy with that, and, which is a little bit of a learning curve for me coming from SolidWorks, because SolidWorks seems like you it prefers for you to draw it in the sketch and then extrude it rather than adding the fat features later. Um, but it seems like Fusion kind of works the opposite. So that is it. That is basically the finished part on these lower runners. If I turn this mesh body back on, you can see that it fits the engine perfectly. And if I turn uh, this intake manifold on, you can see how, what I'm trying to constrain it to space-wise. That's about it for this first body. It's a pretty complicated part, but if you understand how these features work, especially the loft features and your order of operations, so making sure that you do this in a specific order so that it is e easier to create the features you want without altering the features you already have. So again, making the outside of the body first and then cutting those internal features typically works well on this type of a part. So you can see I went back and added some O-ring grooves around the ports here. So these won't even use gaskets, it'll just use O-rings. And this is an EGR that block off that's built into it. So pretty nice part. We can do a section analysis here and we can see the, the port shape. The port shape's looking really good, nice even taper, goes into the head nicely. It curves right here at the end. Um, so it matches the entry angle of the port on the head. And then we have a nice flange up here to create our upper runners. So hopefully I'm not going through this stuff too quickly and it's given you a basic understanding of what it takes to create a part like this. I'm not going super heavy into the details of each individual sketch and things like that because there's plenty of videos out there on that kind of thing. It is very important to figure out and think about your order of operations 
how you're gonna make the part, how you're gonna machine it, and thinking well ahead about the mating parts that are gonna interface this and how you're gonna design those. So it's an exercise in forward thinking for sure. But as you do this more and more, you will definitely get better at it. When I originally started developing intake manifolds, it was, I had nowhere near as a developed of process as I do now, so. And again, these processes are very similar to drawing this in like SolidWorks. The way it's done and the, uh, the workflow is slightly different, but in general, it is relatively the same across most modeling softwares that I've used. So basically this is how you would go about designing a complex part like this in any of those software packages. So again, this part was the basically the start of anything complex that I had done in Fusion 360. And I did make a couple mistakes there right off the bat. One of them being the, the workflow, not really understanding how the workflow works. In SolidWorks, you create individual parts and then you assemble them into assembly file. In Fusion 360, everything is in the same file. So you just create different components within that file. And then you basically use those components to draw the next component and you can keep everything assembled the way you want it or add joints to make it move the way you want it or etc so on so a slightly different work workflow than i was used to but i did figure it out it, it is pretty straightforward so that'll be it for this first installment of building this manifold in the next episode we're going to build the upper runners that mate to these ones so look out for that again please like and subscribe this takes quite a bit of effort to do and i had to learn this all on my own i can't couldn't find content on youtube to teach me how to do this so if you're enjoying this content please do me a favor follow the channel if you want to see a quick video on the details of this how this manifold was made check on this video up here in the corner that video goes into the kind of the order of operations on how i machined these runners in the fourth axis on my little haas cnc mill so go check that out and thanks for watching guys